Welcome to Open Mind GFO Radio. I am your host, Alejandro Rojas, and I am here with Martin Moneybags Willis. Wow. Moneybags. Yeah, you wow. just came what? back from the bank, and uh, <laughs> since you so even late. have a bank yeah. account, you must be pretty highfalutin. Yeah, well, it took a long time to, to get a bank account. <laughs> I saved my pennies and Good. finally did it. Good. Yeah. Congratulations, wow. buddy. Thanks. I feel like I'm part of something now. So this is kind of funny. Uh, I am. My interview is actually after this. Uh, so it's the first time that it's actually in sequence to what the listeners hear where, you know, we do our thing and then I do interview the guest and then I wrap it up. So that's kind of interesting, but fun. And uh, my guest today is Jeremy Corbell. Oh, yep. So, at, and I'll say this, and I'm going to tell him later, uh, I watched his film last night. I got oh, you a did. preview of it, wow. and it is very good, um, and my it changed my questions completely. Really? So, it did, yeah, and here's why. Because it's a lot of Bob Lazar, and I'll, just a little history for those of you who are new who do not know who Bob Lazar, Bob Lazar is a guy who made Area 51 famous. 1989, he came out to the local uh, television station, uh, including investigative reporter George Knapp and a colleague of his, and they interviewed him, and he went by the name Dennis because he was remaining anonymous, and said that he worked at Area 51, or at least this, this uh, lab that is essentially... Um, south of Area 51, but that he had to get to through Area 51. And he back-engineered alien spacecraft. Uh, sounds kind of preposterous, but, uh, you know, it became a huge story. Uh, it, and eventually, you know, and ever since then, Area 51 has been a big deal. And uh, and mm-hmm. it's grown in popularity. And now everybody around the world knows about Area 51, even though... Uh, for a period of time, the government even denied its ex- existence. That's right. Only till a few years ago. Mm-hmm. When I went there with the Kardashians on our TV show, it was they were still denying the existence, even though it was popular enough where they even knew what it was. But um, I forgot about that. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, now you know uh, there are Bob. George Knapp, you and I have talked about him. I admire him greatly. Uh, in mm-hmm. fact, in one of the scenes in the video, you, if you look towards the top of the screen, you could see his row of awards. And he doesn't like to... He's not, He's a very humble person, actually. He is. Yep. He doesn't like to talk about his dozens of awards. Uh, he's won, you know, Edward R. Murrow row Award, Peabody, tons of Emmys. He's won a couple uh, national Emmy, Emmys and a lot of local ones. Uh, So he's a very respected and great journalist, and he believes Bob Lazar, even though he Mm -hmm. thinks maybe there is uh, some problems with a couple of his his claims. So that, to me, holds a lot. And and so I've always had the whole situation in my gray basket, maybe, type Mm -hmm. of thing. And it's even teetered on falling out, being like, you know, this is too ridiculous. But after this film, it's solidly there because Lazar is the guy who is expressing himself. And we haven't had that. Bob Lazar has rarely come forward. Um, He was at Mm -hmm. the UFO Congress and George did like this Q&A with him, but he didn't really answer a lot of questions from the public. And um, I felt George took it a little easy on him, didn't ask him some of the harder questions. But in this film, I'm really proud of Jeremy. He does ask pretty much all, if not the majority, uh, of the tough questions. And so you hear from Lazar's own mouth his answers 
for some of these tough questions. And some of you may agree with, some of you, you don't. I kind of feel like, you know, some of his arguments are a little weak. However, he's coming from the perspective of the the alleged witness. And so um, he can't always completely sympathize with the skeptic. Uh, so I guess I, I could see that. But uh, it, it's yeah, so much Lazar and so much of him answering the tough questions. And so now I feel like I don't want to ask Jeremy about how Lazar feels about X, Y, or Z because I don't want Jeremy to speak for Lazar because in this film, Lazar speaks for himself. So mm. for that reason, I think it's really important that everyone see it, including the skeptic, because I think it changes the conversation. We get more information than we've ever had before. And for the skeptics out there, and even for people like you and I who are just trying to figure it out, or our listeners, uh, we've got to take into account you know, all of these things that Lazar uh, points Lazar is making in this film. And so the conversation's changing a bit. So it ought to be interesting. Well, I, I watched the trailer the other day. I hadn't had, it's been out and I've seen Jeremy actually posted a million times on his Facebook page, but I watched the trailer and I thought, wow, that is really professionally done. So I'm looking forward to watch it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you're going to love it. I think that most people will. I mean, there were some criticisms that, uh, that the Skinwalker movie that Jeremy just did, did not have very didn't have some people said it didn't have any new information which is completely false it definitely had quite a bit of new information i don't know they must have be privy to information nobody else has ever had if they feel that there was nothing new granted there wasn't a whole lot that was new but there was also new stuff we'd never seen before we'd never seen this footage on the ranch that's just the first time it was revealed so uh this one it, you would really be hard pressed to say that there's nothing new because there's not only new information for the first time. Uh, for the most part, we're hearing these answers from the man himself. Uh, right. Well, so, I'm, I will be watching. Yeah. So he was on Coast to Coast last night, I guess. Uh, I didn't hear it because it was late. And I, to be honest, I didn't want to taint myself. I want to yeah. be in the right headspace because this is all so complicated I wanted to, um, you know, and, and I've got to see the film, whereas others and all of our listeners haven't, including the Coast listeners. So, um, yeah, like I said, it totally changes the way I want to approach these questions to Jeremy. So now I want to ask him more along the lines of, you know, Jeremy, how do you feel about this? Uh, how did you get involved? What were your thoughts at the beginning? Um, you know, ask him more personal questions about his experience with Lazar because it, it's actually a good thing that now we don't have to rely on other people who are close to him, like George Knapp, to try to speak for him. We have uh, Lazar himself to speak for himself. Wow, that's great. Yep. Good stuff. So this ought to be a, a lot of fun. Um, and... Uh, and no doubt, it's it's already starting up a lot of debate. Oh, I'm sure. There's always debate around uh, Bob Lazar. In and, fact, uh, one yeah. of the listeners sent me Eric Davis, the physicist who works with uh, To the Stars and has worked with Bob Bigelow, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, which is interesting because, of course, George Knapp works with Bigelow, and Davis is just lighting Lazar up. Like, you know, this guy's a liar, a criminal, blah, blah, blah. And so he certainly <laughs> does not... Uh, by Lazar's story. Hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, well, you'll, you'll hear both sides, that's for sure. And I actually was talking to a guy that's not even in the UFO field or has not even paid much attention to it. And, and uh, uh, I told him I did a show on UFOs, and he said, well, what about Bob Lazar? <laughs> it's like really shocked me that he said that. Yeah. And uh, this was, uh, I don't know, four years ago. And then I said, well, there's a lot of holes in, you know, in some of his claims. And he said, well, how do you know the government didn't do that? I mean, this is a guy that's, I was really shocked that he was talking like this. Wow. And um, he, he seemed to have an answer for any, any argument. Oh, so, and, and so he was solidly, he believed um, yeah. Lazar. Yeah, I said, what about his education? I mean, there's, you know, he, there was a number of things about that. Uh, he says, well, anything can be done when it comes, uh, you know, when it comes to the government. Hmm. This guy sort of has a background that uh, 
a little more of an inside. He had something to do with the government at one time. Hmm. So interesting conversations. Yeah. See, and I almost want to speak to that, but I don't want to do that till the film comes out. Um, mm-hmm. I don't even want to talk to the controversy at all till the film comes out. Because like I said, it changes the conversation. Um, I will say this, that it's still in my gray basket, but that's not saying a whole lot because, uh, you know, the whole phenomenon, whether ETs are visiting us, is totally in my gray basket. But um, I've been waiting to get out of your gray basket. Yeah. You, I'm in there, too. Whether yeah. or not you're an honest, up-and-up person, you mean? Uh, well, you know, I just did get a bank account. If you're so. not... Uh, Trying to, if you're not part of the government that's trying to fool me, that's right. That's why you're in the yeah. Guy. Maybe I'm wearing makeup, my skin is really Martin, gray. Despite yeah. you being late to get to our talk today, you are solidly <sighs> out of my gray basket in a good way. You Whew. are, you have convinced me that you're a good dude. Well, thank you. Wow, and I, I hope am that's so honored. Yeah. So uh, you sp- I bet you want me to do some news. Yeah, let's do that. All right, let's do that. UFO okay. news. UFO news. So in the UFO headlines on openminds.tv, you'll find this story. Uh, St. Helens woman reports UFO sightings. And one of the reasons I would like to talk about this is because um, it's a, a NBC news station, K-O-I-N, uh, Channel 6, and uh, out that way in the Portland, Oregon area. Um, she, uh, they, they, both uh, commentators are taking the subject very seriously and they talk about it and they have an on-site, uh, reporter that goes out and, uh, speaks with the, uh, woman. Her name is, uh, Michelle Gabrielli and she shared her, uh, she shared her videos. Uh, it was a two, two night sighting, uh, right in the St. Helens area. And I don't know if you've ever been out there. It's really beautiful out that way. Um, so she saw a row of at least she's saying at least 15 strange lights and they seem to fly apart and then back together. So I know it's a lights in the sky story, you know, but part of the, um, you know, part of the reason I wanted to talk about it is because the news station was taking it very seriously. There wasn't absolutely no ridicule or any tone of that. And they actually went on to say, the reporter went on to say, you know, if you have uh, more interest in UFOs, you can check you know the internet and see that you know oregon has of uh, the second largest amount of ufo sightings and you know he was basically saying go check it out you know there's a lot more information out there and the video does show this uh this object just a single object doesn't show the 15 of them but it kind of blinks in and out it does look pretty mysterious but of course you know there's always the argument about hey everyone has a high definition you know camera video camera on their phone why why don't you get better pictures and better video there's always those comments out there but i will Mm -hmm. say that uh you know i have tried to film things at night it's not easy and i have the iphone 8 it's not easy you know you just can't can't get good quality image at night but anyway i think it's a it's kind of a interesting film and it's right there if you follow the link it's right there um you know actually during the newscast which is on video yeah, I, f- I thought that one was a little bit hard. I mean, it could be something. It looks like something out of focus. So uh, it's right. And that's yeah. the hard part. And, uh, you know, we I make fun of my our friend Mark D'Antonio a lot. But, but he makes the point that, you know, when you're looking at videos, you have to, uh, you know, look at it from the perspective of does this video alone prove anything? Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I don't think these do because they're out of light. They're out of focus lights. And you know, it's always so difficult because I got an email from a listener, and I hope we may even hear this before I get to him. But uh, the pictures that he shows are out of focus. They look like out of focus stars because when it's very hard to focus in on a single point of light. When you're focusing with your camera, you need to make that point of light as tiny as possible. Remember, these are stars. These are things that are very, very far away. If they look like fuzzy globules, like these videos that are changing colors, it's because A, it's out of focus, and two, scintillation. You're going through the atmosphere, and the atmosphere is affecting the light, getting to your camera, and, um, you know, the, the way the atmosphere works is very much like when you look at a street, 
when it's hot out, you know, you see the waves um, and you have right. this wavy thing going on in the sky. And so you have these waves of, of atmosphere that are affecting the light and making the light change colors. And that's what you're seeing. So any star at any night, you can go out and, uh, you know, try to even use your phone or use a camera and try to film and, and have it out of focus and look like something really strange. I mean, uh, I was just the other night we were hanging out with uh, the Stacy Wright who runs Phoenix MUFON. Uh, one of the people who runs the Phoenix area or Arizona MUFON. And she was talking about how they get so many and she was pointing out, look, you know, here's one of the bright stars. It was probably Sirius or maybe it was... Uh, a planet look it's coming up over the horizon and look how it looks like it's changing colors it almost looks like it's spinning or something we get so many reports of that and that's what these pictures are that i've gotten um and that could be what these this video is that this woman got and this is just a common thing so you have to be careful there's a lot of reasons why things will look really strange and and that's why actually as much as i like to make fun of them having a resource like Mark D'Antonio, who can explain why these images look the way they do, uh, is extremely helpful. It's invaluable. Um, so we mm -hmm. all get educated on what's not the phenomena. That's right. Um, you know, it, it does, it, well, her testimony, or whatever you'd like to call it, um, is totally different than just the video there she's yes. filming. You know, she talks about 15 of them, and them in two nights in a row and then you know changing formations and all that um so the testimony would definitely have to be more valuable obviously and when you point out all those things but also um she herself says these are only a ufo to me because they are unidentified you know she makes it very clear she's saying it's not i'm not saying it's aliens but it's something going on you know with them flying around like that so uh Anyway, I think it's still a good report, and you know maybe you do need to throw out the video and just take the verbal on, on this one in particular because the video is, like you say, you know, fading in and out. Like I, I've actually seen that before too myself, so mm -hmm. I know what you're talking about. Well, and the other is true too, and in, in that it could be something anomalous there, um, mm -hmm. and because let's say uh, you know a lot of the sightings that are credible are are points of lights moving in strange ways. Uh, and when you're zoomed in on a point of light and at night, I mean, it could be something anomalous. You just can't tell from the video because it looks no different than a star out of focus. So it's even possible that it is something strange, especially based off the testimony. Um, you just can't prove it with the video. And so you're right. So then you're just left with the, uh, the anecdotal, um, testimony of the witness and, and, that is the best evidence you have. So, yeah, that's, that's a really great point. Why, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good job, buddy. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's what's going on. Anything, any other news you want to talk about? No, that in particular, um, you know, there's still a lot of uh, news going around. If anyone checks, you know, UFO news, there's still a ton of, uh, you know, news going around about the Irish uh, you know, commercial airline uh, lights in the sky again, once again, but all but moving fast. And I know there's still people trying to explain it off. Astronomers trying to explain it off as, you know, an astronomical event. But uh, it still would be pretty strange with all the different characteristics. So there's still a lot of that going around. I'm actually have on my show in a couple of days. Uh, I have, uh, or on Tuesday, I have, um, you know, a air safety. Uh, person on to talk about oh, that cool. and a number of a number of other sightings oh that's really so, cool yeah um, so and you know this is kind of interesting a story that we talked about in the past uh it, it's getting a little more attention and it, it's kind of a fun story although it might frustrate some people and we had it on last week's headlines but uh this week the new york times actually wrote about it the it was a smaller paper that had written about it in the past. But this is this UFO statue near the Statue oh, yeah. of Liberty. Right. And I so, saw that. yeah, and it's in the New York Times now. Right. So it's really um, fun. Uh, and just so people know, this isn't a real incident. So if you're visiting the 
the Statue of Liberty and, uh, you know, you're there on the bank of New York Harbor to get a look uh, it's Battery Park is what it's called, but to get a look at the, the Statue of Liberty and you're like, what the heck? There's a statue of a of a seaman with an alien here. What is this all about? Well, that is an artist installation. So what this artist did was kind of create this uh, story about an alien and uh, that these people essentially and this boat had seen this this UFO during uh, a um, the 1977 um, power outage, and that uh, they had seen this UFO and then this UFO beamed a light on them and then they disappeared and these people in this boat were never seen again. And the statue is commemorating this event. It was actually made by a, an artist, and that is not a real event. Uh, that did not happen. But That's in a way, right. it's still kind of fun because the, I don't know, I still think it's kind of fun, even though I'm sure people get frustrated. Why is he mudding the water and, you know, kind of faking this stuff? But, um, and I'm sure he's right that, you know, this will be, people start to believe this really happened when it didn't. But uh, yeah, it is, it is not a true story, people, just so you know. But I don't know anybody who's done this yet. We've already said, you know, people, if you are going uh, if you're in the new york area go visit this and go take pictures of it and send it in to us but uh yeah this story's in the new york times now yeah and the artist's name is uh uh Reganella, uh i believe it is and it shows a picture in the story of him uh wearing a t-shirt with a ufo over the statue of liberty beaming a light down on it it's pretty funny yeah um and but he all the way through this he he says this is a fairy hoax um you know it's all you know, it's it's just it was just a fun thing for him to do. That's all. Yeah, you know, and it it's just so funny because it, it's like it, I think what will happen, and we've seen this in the past. Not that I can think of a well, I can think of a particular incident where just people grab on, and it's this whole oh, I want to believe. People want yes. to believe so badly, and and it's one of the things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's important that we check ourselves. You know, if you have this feeling that you That's want right. to believe so badly, you have to be careful that you're not letting that shade your your views because no doubt this will become this mythology out there that's false. Uh, and another example would be Dean Alioto uh, when he created this film um, oh, yeah. about this abduction and uh, it was fake. It was a movie. It wasn't sure. meant to be, uh, you know, tricking people so they believe that it's real. But uh, everybody believes that it is real, and uh, or not a lot only, of people do. Yeah, pardon me. I was just saying, not only that, but people have said, I know the family, the yeah. family that was abducted, and I know when they disappeared. You know, it's like they're really into it. Yeah, it's, and it, this film was called Alien Abduction Incident in Lake County. Um, and yeah, you can find it on YouTube, and people believing it's real. And he kind of came to the conference last year to speak about it, tell people, "Hey guys, this wasn't real." But what's really funny about it too is that he was um, there was a couple of lectures at the UFO Congress like ten years ago, who did a whole talk about how this abduction was real. Yes, <laughs> and it wasn't. It's pretty funny. And Dean himself is a riot. He's really funny. Yeah, he's cool. Did you, you interviewed him on your show, right? I did, yes. Yeah, yeah. he's a really cool guy. He's a lot of fun. Yep, yep. But it is, you're right. Uh, this, you never know. This may become a reality, uh, you know, a faux reality out there uh, as time goes on. As long as the statue stays up, people will be talking about it. Mm -hmm. People will be saying, oh. Martin and Alejandro are such debunkers. They say that the Statue yeah. of Liberty UFO wasn't even real. We know <laughs> it's real. That's right. I was there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was there. My grandpa saw it happen. Yeah, I was in the tugboat. I was down bailing it out. <laughs> yeah. So I was spared. So there we go. There's some information and news. Otherwise, there's not a whole lot of UFO news, um, which may be good for Jeremy because, uh, you know, him and the release of his film, which comes up, you know, on the 4th, everybody will be able to watch it. If you go That's to, right. uh, uh, well, we'll talk about it more. But, uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and interview Jeremy because our time is up, my friend. I see that. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us once again. Uh, as always, it's my pleasure. 
All right. Well, let's go ahead and talk to Mr. Corbell after this short break. I'm happy to welcome back to the show Jeremy Corbell, filmmaker extraordinaire. Hello. Hey, Alejandro. Thanks so much for having me on again. I'm, this is, I'm really excited to talk about this film with you. Well, you've been so busy. And of course, you know, to me, uh, I felt Skinwalker was so important. It was it's so important that you did that film and you shared that information. And then here, right on the heels of of that film is this other one, which is actually, to be honest, you know, even more important, I feel, than I expected it to be. Well, that's a huge compliment. I appreciate <laughs> that. Uh, you know, my goal in filmmaking and the style that I make films is kind of the, the tour style, which is meaning, you know, fully independent. I'm fanatical and have control over every frame, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the style of my filmmaking. And to hear a compliment from you on that, um, that it, you know, has some sort of impact um, is great because, uh, you know, this is important to me. I wouldn't be telling a story if I didn't feel it was important to share. So yeah, mm -hmm. thanks for watching it. Yeah. And it, this is a funny part. We talked a little bit about it earlier, but it, it the one thing I, I saw it last night, so I should tell the audience that, and it totally changed my line of questioning uh, for our interview today, because what's great about this film and unique and, and why it's so one of the reasons why it's so important is that, you know, I was going to ask you some of the tough questions, and then I thought that's that would be ridiculous of me to do that because I would be asking you to speak for Bob when you don't have to because in your film, you ask all of the tough questions, and we hear it from Bob's mouth himself. And so I think it's important that before we even go there that people hear what Bob says from his own mouth including new information that you reveal in this that, that we've never seen before. Yeah, I love it. I, you know, I kind of uh, absorb it all online, you know, people already, you know, loving or hating, you know, on the movie and you haven't even seen it yet. And all mm -hmm. the hate and all the people throwing casting doubt on me and all this stuff. Yeah, you, you get ready. There, there's, there's meat in this film and exactly. you're going to devour it. Exactly. And I think I feel personally and people know I've been on the fence with Lazar that this film changes the conversation. And that's why I don't think we can even debate it, Lazar without this film coming out first, because it changes the conversation and the debate can it changes the debate. And you can't debate this topic without including some of the information that that is being revealed in this film. Well, again, Alejandro, that's probably the greatest compliment that I could get for the film because the whole point in creating this film was to provide a new element or elements to uplift the conversation, to make it more exacting and powerful, to alter it, to give people something they didn't have before so that that conversation can be elevated and changed because, look, you know, Lazar is polarizing. He always has been polarizing. He came forward in 1989 with George Knapp, and George Knapp was the sole individual responsible for keeping that story alive, for bringing Bob, twisting his arm, keeping him coming forward for those 25 years, even a minute at a time, just saying, look, this happened. I don't do UFO circuits, but this happened, and you got to deal with it. And up till now, George is the only person who was able to do that and, and get that going. But in the film, as you know, Alejandro, you're going to see a different Bob Lazar. You're going to see who Bob Lazar is because my biggest point has always been if you have a powerful message, the easiest way – and look, this is a warfare tactic. As a martial athlete myself, I can tell you this is one of the greatest mental warfare tactics. You dehumanize the messenger. And if you can do that, then you have crushed their message. And this is something that has been happening to Bob Lazar since the beginning in 1989. He hasn't made it easy. He, he has actually made it easy to do that yeah. by uh, 
basically walking away, you know, by, by, you know, not making himself super available and, you know, going over his story over and over and over for people. So this is really neat. It's a really interesting time, a pertinent time for all of this to begin. For sure. And that's another reason why it's so impactful and the, the timing is so important. And and we'll get more into that later. But uh, to your point, you know, it was interesting because at times when you ask questions and he answered, it was like, you know, he was critical of people who are skeptical, but he's coming from a perspective of the alleged witness essentially. So he'd not, he, I think it would be hard for him to put himself completely in the shoes of a skeptic, which makes sense. Uh, well, I think actually, I think he does a great job of seeing it from other people's perspective for the last 30 years. I mean, he says, look, if, if I, I'm not trying to convince you of anything, I told my story because I felt the duty to do it. First of all, sec, you know, the, originally it was, if you believe him or not, you know, it was, it was to protect himself, which it was, whether you believe it or not, but, uh, he can put himself in the shoes of other people. And he says, look, I, I don't have all the evidence to prove this to you beyond a shadow of a, a doubt. It is a requirement that you are skeptical. If you are not skeptical, then you will not uh, come to a conclusion of any satisfaction if you are not skeptical. So he encourages people to look at it. He just doesn't want people to fabricate and twist mm. and distort the facts so they don't have the proper information. Because ultimately what he is saying, if we give him the benefit of the doubt, even theoretically, it's important. And so his point is, I can understand skepticism. I can't understand dismissal mm. or fake news and false information that does nobody any good so that's my argument about that i i think bob actually can see it you know through other people's eyes and he's the one of the most critical thinking people i've ever met mm -hmm. now before we move away from necessarily uh you know specific content in the film uh because like i said i, I think bob speaks for himself very well uh i i still have a bunch of questions for you about you know your relationship and how you got involved in everything however you were on coast to coast just a few hours ago really um and i was sleeping getting some sleep because i have a busy week but uh, so unfortunately i didn't hear it live but i was wondering if you were willing to share if there were any uh pieces of news that were revealed last night Sure. Yeah. You know, uh, George knows exactly what buttons to push on me and Bob. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I, I, if we want to go right into that, um, I mean, I do want to tell you first off that my, my goal was, as I said, was to really mm -hmm. uplift cinematically, you know, the, the style of film that we get to view as people fascinated by UFOs, right. Um, in making these films, I, first, my first priority is to learn the truth. I've always wanted to know the truth about Bob Lazar. So this film really was about me learning the truth over more than a decade now of, of actually filming, you know. So if you really add it all up, man, I mean, this is like this was the case that started me off on everything. Wow. Right. So so I yeah, you know, 13 years old. I heard Bob describe the propulsion systems of a field propulsion system, a non reactionary, you know, craft system, a gravity wave amplification system. It blew my mind. It flipped my script. It made me interested. So, yeah, this is the case. I always wanted to know is Bob telling the truth? That's what everybody wants to know. So first and foremost, you know, making this film, I wanted to know the truth. I wanted to share the truth with you, whatever that truth may be, but I also wanted to uplift the film, the visual aesthetic, and just the, the, the power of it to reach millions and millions of people, two generations over 30 years that weren't even born yet when Bob told his story. And I want to expose them to this story so they can make the decision for themselves. And one of the vehicles in which I did that is I got Oscar-nominated actor Mickey Rourke to narrate the film in his powerful, beautiful rebel voice. And wow, it is effective. This has sparked an infectious interest in the movie. Just having Mickey associated with the movie 
brings it to a level that no UFO movie has currently achieved. And I'm not bragging, I'm confessing. I'm telling you the truth. Having an Oscar-nominated actor as the narrator will uplift the UFO genre. It will lift the bar, and it will make it so we have to make better and better films. And, man, we need that. How cool is Mm -hmm. Mickey Rourke? Yeah, you know, and what's interesting, you know, hearing you say that and uh, covering entertainment, um, you know, uh, when I write uh, stories is just how impactful. That's why movies scramble to get these people in their films, because for better or worse, uh, people pay much more attention when you have an A-lister. And and you know what? And you're right. And I I appreciate you understand that being a journalist who does cover popular culture in all the forms that you write. You know, obviously, you don't just write about UFOs. I've seen the way you tie in all of these deep concepts. So look, I agree. And I did scramble. Luckily, Mickey, you know, we've had we have a history. And I have to say too, don't make judgments on Mickey without understanding. I filmed, you know, maybe six, seven years ago, I filmed the only time Mickey's ever gone on camera talking about UFOs. Now, now I've never released that. However, there is a quote that you were the first to publish that is released, which is about Mickey's thoughts on UFOs. So don't disclude him from being one of us people, someone that is interested in this mystery. Right. And that's a moot point anyway, I feel for, for those people. I, and I think I made that point. I don't know if you saw it. Someone was criticizing that. What does Mickey work have to do with UFOs? Well, narrators are not chosen because they're related to the topic. Typically they're, they're chosen because they fit the, the role, which is, you know, Mickey has this great voice, so he's perfect for it. In fact, he reminds me of the character, you know, like on Half-Life or something like that. But, um, in this case, we have the added advantage that he is interested in the topic. That's right. Absolutely. And, and also he understands as an independent filmmaker that, you know, helping me, giving me a leg up allows my message to be heard more broadly. And thankfully, he cared to help. Right, which is a big deal. So yeah, I feel so lucky and honored, man. Mm. I really, and it, I think people should be appreciative. He put his neck out on the line for the film. I mean, a, a lot of people passed on, on, on narrating a UFO film. A lot of people yeah. passed. What's interesting too. And, and I've ran into this so much is that when we write about celebrities, uh, there are a lot of people in the UFO field who get upset. And I, I personally do not completely understand it because they're like, what do celebrities know? But these are the, uh, you know, these are our cultural leaders for better or worse, whether you like it or not. These are the people that everybody takes cues from on how to even how to dress, how to act, uh, their hairstyles and what have you. And so people pay attention to these people. So I personally am always very pleased when uh, a celebrity feels comfortable enough to come out and either discuss or like Tom DeLonge, champion, um, you know, getting information out. And and I don't think that's anything we should be upset about, but it's something that we should, you know, um, encourage and i hope that and i think that when people like mickey rourke do this sort of thing then it does encourage some of his colleagues to to follow suit yeah it's look it's giving me goosebumps when you're talking about this you know it infuriates me that people say oh if you're a celebrity you can't have an opinion on ufos who are you to own the field get out (laughs) of my way are you kidding me you got you should thank people like tom like Robbie Williams, right. who has a huge, massive career. He just sold out uh, uh, over a dozen dates instantaneously, one of the fastest sellouts ever in Las Vegas of tickets. Uh, and that's in America, where he's not really advertised that much. I mean, he's crushing it. And he puts everything on the line, and he puts my trailer out on his Instagram with this, you know, 1.6 million follow, what maybe it's two point, whatever he has. I mean, these people have more to lose than any troll online who think they can't have an opinion on UFOs. You should be thanking them. Mm-hmm. I agree 1,000%. So it's great that you got Mickey Rourke in. And I'm grateful to hear because I didn't even think to ask you the question. It's great to hear that he has had such an impact on interest on the film. He has. Mm-hmm. So 
And I know you're you're you want to set it up appropriately. Uh, the news that okay, you broke okay. last night, and not that I know what it is, but yeah, feel free. Whatever you feel okay, that you okay. need to so, share before getting to that point. Yeah, look, you know, whenever you're talking in an in interview and it's before a movie comes out, you know, yeah. you can always defer and say, well, you'll see in the movie as like a sales pitch for the movie. But you know, look, there's a lot of breaking news, a lot of new information in the movie. If you just open your eyes and I'll, I'll premise this with people said, Oh, skinwalker, your film on skinwalker didn't have any new information. Oh, okay. So you had footage of Robert Bigelow on camera talking right. about skinwalker ranch. No, you did not. You right. had the new owner on camera and you knew his intention with the ranch explained to you on camera. No, you did not. There were so many firsts with that film. People that say that they're literally blind. And so here we go. I'm about to launch a film. It will satisfy people who you know are deep into this, but it will also satisfy the newbie and someone who's never looked at this. And, and if you're not satisfied, that's your own problem. And you need to go more than an inch deep. But that's just me defending my film. I will say. And but I you're right. You I just made the same point, actually, before you came on. Oh, you did? Okay, yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I appreciate that other people are making that point because it is factually true. Mm-hmm. So anyway, um, look, I'm not looking to satisfy the loud minority. I am looking to satisfy everybody. You know, I mean, that's a mm-hmm. lofty goal, but I'm trying to with my films. So I would give you some meat and potatoes and things you didn't know before. I will share one of them with you. So or, or maybe two, because many didn't make it into the film, but one that made it into the film that I'll share now a little spoiler. So close your ears if you don't want to know. It's just a little piece that I go over. So after 30 years and through the lens of 30 years, things change. Things change for people interpersonally with their jobs. 30 years ago, George Knapp goes on the you know air and he says, the FBI visited Bob Lazar. He, he thinks it was the FBI. There was a guy named Mike Thigpen. And this guy you know, was doing security clearance for Bob. And everybody's like, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, right. That's another thing Bob made up, right? So George tried to track it down, found out that it wasn't. He got a lead from an FBI guy. Hey, this wasn't the FBI. This was the OFI, organization that George had never heard about. Nobody had really heard about this. And it's the Office of Federal Investigation. And indeed, they do clearances for Nellis at the time, for 51 and beyond. Top clearances. So George goes digging, finds out there is a guy named Thinkpin. Never got to talk to the guy. I actually, after 30 years, I found him. I found Mike Thinkpin. I've talked to him. He was almost going to go on camera with me and then decided he couldn't put a black stain on a perfect career that he had. But he says, you can tell people what we talked about. I said, okay, no problem. Yes, Mike Thinkpin in 1989, he did clearances for the, for the complex, for the base, for 51, high-end clearances. He did that in 1989. Guess what? He remembers Bob. Hmm. Take that for what you will. I found him. He additionally said to me, which really drove me crazy, I said, can I talk to you about Area S4? And he says, I will make an official request to see if I can talk to you about S4. I have yet to be able to get to the point where he, I get an answer from him. But the point is, through the lens of 30 years, a lot can happen. Mm-hmm. I found Mike Thinkpin. How did Bob know? Did he just make that name up out of thin air and get it right? How did he know? If, and, and how does this guy remember Bob if his whole story is a fabrication? Mm-hmm. So, you know, look, man, there's things like this that just drive, you know, little breadcrumbs doesn't prove the whole story by any means. But you can't dismiss what I just told you. And not only that is that um, in this case, he didn't go on the record and he didn't let you interview him. However, in your film there are others who did let you film them and so uh you know before people are like oh man if that's the best thing he has that sucks you know there's a lot more in the film this is just one little piece that to add to a a mountain of information that they're here they'll hear in the film and 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 i'm gonna argue alejandro isn't what people want is to hear from bob directly because a lot of my film is modern footage. I I use the archive footage and the hard work of George Knapp to set up 
the modern footage so you can compare and contrast everything from micro expressions to tonation of voice to the words being said then to the words being said now, but also to show you who Bob is. But the majority of the film is Bob Lazar, modern day. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And, and uh, yeah, exactly. And that's why I, I think it, it's so important. Um, and I should say, just just kind of my view, so people know, I've always, Bob has always been in my gray basket, but kind of sometimes teetering where he's about to fall out, and not on the good end, on the end that, you know, this is too ridiculous, I'm not going to waste my time on this. But with this film, I mean, he is firmly in my gray basket, which practically everything is. There's a very little that is not. So, But firmly in there, where... Uh, just kind of like you said, you know, it, it's 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 like there are these extraordinary cases, like let's say Travis Walton, where it's like I can't, you know, discount the, even though this what they're claiming has happened is is extraordinary and kind of crazy. There's just too much to discount, and with this film, I think, uh, I don't know. To, to me, it feels like it almost doubles the amount of information on why you should feel that this is a. a something to pay attention to that you can't just offhandedly disregard yeah I, I hope i've given you and that's great you know awesome statistic i hope it does give you double the <laughs> amount of reason i'm glad he's solidly in your gray basket which is the only place he can ever really be if yeah. you think about it he said to you look i can't prove it definitively but you can't discount me if you look at the evidence and i, I find mm-hmm. that to be a very true statement so the idea that he can be firmly in the gray basket then that is your determination i am definitely not trying to force feed you oh, i no. press bob in the film I press him hard. I press him in ways you haven't seen him pressed. I yes. get to the emotional core, and and also I get to a point where he tells you what he thinks the most important stuff is. So I think it's a success all around because we all want the same thing. We all want the truth, and when you boil it down, and we don't got to get into it now. We can get into it later, but when you boil down – the character assassinations, attempts on, on Bob where where people say ridiculous stuff about it or the stuff that's not ridiculous that you should be skeptical about. You know, the things like his education that, that make people foam at the mouth and go crazy mm-hmm. because there's nothing we can do to prove or disprove it. Ultimately, you, you have to look at it and you have to balance all the evidence and you have to say, what do I believe? Mm-hmm. Where, how do I feel about this now? Because if you rely on someone else for your, you know, for your understanding, you are never going to come to your own conclusion. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, I'm just thinking, you know, head is kind of twirling with all of the information. Uh, but uh, when it comes to you and your take on the film, I guess, when you first started looking into this, do you... Feel when at least you started the film that your uh, your opinion was already solid. Were you already? Did you already feel? Wow, this guy is telling the truth before you started this project. You know, um, there was. You know, I think before I started the filming, I had a very unique perspective on being able to see the truth of how this went down from everybody close to it, even people I haven't mentioned yet who knew Bob before he was Bob the UFO guy. I knew him from Los Angeles, used to drop him off at Caltech. So I had a unique perspective. So yes, to be honest, before I started, I already chose to believe Bob based upon the informed information I had. However, I will tell you, the moment Pandora's box was opened and I was then given absolute freedom and carte blanche to go through any box, any document, any photos, anything off of the shelf, in the basement, through the cell phone, through text messages, through uh, you know, phone, you know, his phone list, call his family. When I was given that right, which I was, mm-hmm. and that's something important to know. Bob restricted me in zero ways. The Mm. only thing that he put on me was that I may not lie to sensationalize or or just sensationalize at all his story. 
All right, and we'll stop there because we got to take our first break. So we'll be right back with Jeremy Corbell. We're talking about his new film uh, regarding Bob Lazar. We're going to take a short break, and then we'll be right back. You're listening to Open Mind UFO Radio. Welcome back to Open Mind UFO Radio. I'm your host, Alejandro Rojas, and we have Jeremy Corbell, filmmaker of the uh, new Bob Lazar Area 51 movie. In fact, it's called Area 51 and Flying Saucers. That will be coming out in the next few days, and we'll talk to you about how you can get it. But we were just talking about whether or not Jeremy, going into the film, uh, had believed Lazar and and you said yes. But I gotta say that's fair, and I'm not trying I'm to about set to you change- up. Yeah, yeah, no, but I'm about to change the answer in a way. Oh, okay. Because I, I, I'm saying, I'm saying yes. By that time, I had such a unique vantage that I that I did choose to believe based on information that I have that is not necessarily information that most people have. However, when given that opportunity and how open he made his life, I put my feelings and thoughts aside, and I said, okay, I'm going to approach this just like. Anybody who heard this story for the first time, and I'm going to come at it with not from a perspective of belief or disbelief, but from a perspective of tell me your story. I want to hear it. And then anything that doesn't add up, I'm going to ask you a question about. So from a filmmaking standpoint, this is not just like a, hey, you know, everybody, you should believe Bob. You know, my personal if I believe Bob or not, it's totally different than yours because my data sets are different than yours. However, the film equalizes that to a high degree. It gives you insight you didn't have before. It's important you form your own opinion and you decide to tweet, I believe Bob Lazar or I don't believe Bob Lazar. You know, go hashtag what, whichever <laughs> one you think because, um, you know, look, man, this conversation needs to happen. Yeah. And I, I think that's, that's fair. That's what a journalist does. And I think that's what I felt was great about this film, because I think you grew in that way. I think that you, like you said, you asked the hard questions. Because honestly, I feel that George was easy on him at the UFO Congress a few years ago. Um, you know, we were, and I know George was nervous to ask some of the harder questions. And, and, uh, and so it was a little well, let's more. T- let's talk about that. Yeah, because mm-hmm. I, I actually I want to address that directly. And, okay, great. Um, because you know George, as you know, he's a friend, and he's but but he's my mentor. Mine so too. So I'm looking, yeah, and so I'm looking at it from a a point of somebody I really respect in journalism, and your statement, you know, he you thought he was kind of easy on Bob. So let's just back up a second. Um, the fact Bob was there to share anything was a miracle. Right, G- George. To get him there was I, – I saw it and I know you did too. Bob is allergic to interviews and it's not because he can't stand up for himself. It's because he's been so crapped on by the UFO community. It, it's almost like I've said my story. I got nothing else to say. Why? So do you want to bring – twist his arm, try to get him to come and kind of reveal more and just basically punch him in the balls? I mean is that what you're trying to do? <laughs> No, no. What we want to do as journalists is we want to get the most out of somebody that we can. And the the way to do that is not always to just go for the intestines and try to gut somebody. The way to do that is, you know, look, sugar and spice and everything nice. You know, it's to bring people in, get them to open up, relax, and give you the most you're going to get. All the hard questions have been asked. And all the hard questions have been answered to the degree in which they can degree at that specific time. Now, we are 30 years later, and those harder questions can be answered maybe with more insight now. But in defense of what you said about George, I want to say I think he did an incredible job. 
I think it was heroic to be able to get Bob there, to get Bob to sit down in front of people. This is so Twilight Zone that he could even get him. And then to ask the questions he did, he's trying to get Bob to reveal as much as he can. And you know what? Everybody else is going to ask the hard questions and they're going to get the answers. And um, I got to say, George was not light on him on on the show last night. George has never been light on him. I think that situationally at that time, he did an excellent, excellent job because the only person asking the hard questions at the beginning, it was George Knapp. He was the only one. Everybody yes. else was being dismissive. So George has already asked. He put him in front of people, employees of Area 51 back in 1989 and grilled him. George Knapp set up four polygraph tests, put Bob through it. Bob immediately, without reluctance, said he'd do it. So if anybody has been harder on Bob Lazar over the years, it has been George Knapp. Now, I agree with you. But what I'm saying is not necessarily that it's it's George because – I can never say enough good things about George. He's he's absolutely amazing. He can do no wrong in my eyes. However, uh, it really wasn't the setting, and I think you made the good point. It wasn't the the proper setting, and and I think you kind of frame it well where it was. And I think Bob did a good job actually on stage expressing how uh, he really didn't want to do it. He said that he said. Uh, he said that open minds threatened to sue me, but in a nice way. That's uh, pretty much what he Look, said, which it, is funny. We didn't really threaten. Truth. We just reminded him, hey, you signed a yeah. contract that you'd be there. And, and you know what? And he, and he did sign a contract to be there, and you and did, did it. it. And then he ended up doing it. But yeah, yeah, but look, this is not an act. This is real. Bob does not – okay, I'm going to tell you a private story now. Okay. Uh, look, th this is real. And uh, Bob's a real person. There's real people that depend on him. There's real people in his life. There's his wife of 18 years who slept next to him. There, there's his mom. Does he lie to his mom? Does he lie to his wife? I mean, we have to understand it's against his nature to do this. It's not he can't defend himself. It's not he's not intelligent enough. He just doesn't boast about it. He doesn't push things in your face. He has no personal desire to convince the world of anything. He's busy doing other stuff. So I'll, I'll share with you a personal story so you can kind of get an insight into who Bob Lazar is. If you remember in 1989, or actually it was more towards 1990, when they were about to reveal Bob's identity, and, and George says, up to the minute, you can tell me and I won't air it. Well, they got up to the minute, and George and Bob I mean, wrestling match. Bob tried to grab the tape. He's like, no, this is wrong. They're going to kill me. I don't want to do this. I don't want to have wow. my face out. This is the wrong move. They wrestle on the ground. George rips the tape from his hand. They wrestle goes, on the ground? They physically wrestled on the ground. And George said, they, they ended up on the ground. And, and George says, y you no, know, I, I meant last minute, but not now. We are four minutes away to broadcast. He puts the tape in and history is made. Wow. So the thing is, in another way, this is the personal story. I didn't wrestle with Bob, but I got to tell you, this movie almost didn't happen. It almost didn't happen after it was done. It almost didn't happen upon the first viewing to Bob because I told him, look, you know, he said, the only thing you can't do is lie. I said, Bob, I got the movie. It's done. You're going to love it. It's amazing. There's nothing fabricated. It's very direct. Oh, man. The text I got after that, talking to him the next day, he was – trembling with anger wow the film the and and now we we get it now we get it he loves the film now right Good. like okay i get what you did jeremy but it brought up so many it dredged up the past a time period where he lost his wife who was cheating on him where his friends were intimidated whether you believe it or not it happened i've talked to them almost all of them they were intimidated by very scary agencies. So it brought up so much negative emotion. I kind of had my own wrestling match with Bob and it took days for us to come to see eye to eye. I had to explain every part of the movie and why I think it's important to dredge up his past. Mm -hmm. Which is getting to my point actually in a wonderful way. Thank you so much for sharing that. Which is that you did not... Uh, 
you had a better setting to be able to ask those questions. Yes. And in the film that comes across that you were challenging him, I mean, there were even times where he said, I'm not going to answer that, but you didn't let go. You're like, well, hey, Bob, you know, and you explained to him, this is why this, this question is important. And so it came across that you were really challenging him and you were doing uh, what, you know, like a journalist should do. And, and that's what... Uh, it's great. It, it gave me confidence that, you know, um, because a lot of times he, he goes to uncomfortable places and, and your story right now makes sense because it's very raw. I mean, it's very u- real and and um, I can see why he'd be uncomfortable, but that's a good sign because that means you are sharing, you know, uh, pertinent information and that you did challenge him in, in a way that was important for the viewers. Yeah, and I appreciate that. And look, I mean, you know, in one hand, I mean, I will admit, you know, over the course of filming somebody, they become a friend. So you feel, you know, protective of them on a friendship level. But I also have a duty. And he understood that I have a duty that if I'm going to make this movie in the style that I have been making movies, my idea is to show the extraordinary beliefs of people that I find to be credible but to try to get to the meat and heart of it. And if you're lying and if you're deceiving the public, I'm going to out you. And he knew that. He knew that from the beginning. If I found a scrap of paper, if I found a video, anything, anything that uh, you know debunked him, that that was going public. And that's why I found it so fascinating how willing he became w- once we became comfortable with the idea that I was doing this. Just full boxes full boxes of tape. You have no idea what's on them. I got the whole thing, digitized everything. I totally open. I even asked him, would you do another polygraph without hesitation for the film? He's like, yep, no problem. However, polygraphs over time are less valuable than right in the moment when George put him through four that he already passed. So I didn't do that for the film. Mm. Spoiler alert. But, um, you know, it's just, yeah, man, thank you. That was a big part of it, and I would just – the most important thing is that we now have more information, more data, more testimony, more stories, more ideas, more facts, and that was a big goal. Yeah, and you know a lot of this – to be honest, but it's great to hear all of this. A lot of this, the film does very well stand alone. So I think even a lot of what you're stressing here is is done very well in the film. I think all of the points are made. I did not feel, and I'm critical, and and people know, right. you know, uh, and I people might think, oh, he's friends with Jeremy, so he's taking it easy on Jeremy. I'm I'm not. I would I would share with you. We we're comfortable enough to, with each yeah, other. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I respect you your opinion, and you have shared with me when you yeah. didn't like something. So I respect that. Yeah. And so, but you know, I felt very satisfied with the film. That you know, uh, there were times where I'm like, I wish you'd ask this, or I would wish you'd ask that, and but they were asked. In fact, I. I might be able to, if I watch it again, think of maybe one thing, but otherwise everything was, was covered very well. All of the, the, the reasons behind, you know, uh, how things, all the mechanisms happen are shared and, uh, which I think is really important. So I, I felt really strongly that way. And I feel that, you know, the arguments that you're making here are made very well in the film, not just by you, but also by George and also by Bob Lazar himself, which is great. Yeah, and and, and the one thing that you, whatever it is that you might think you might have asked, understand Alejandro, in the, and people don't really understand this yet, so let me articulate it. I have a job to make a film consumable by the widest possible audience Mm -hmm. so that people can start to understand and come and participate in this field that we call ufology because I think it's important. That is the goal. However, with my films, there are over two hours of intimate bonus material for this. And this is not like, you know, for like better sales. This is because... I want to provide you more footage that doesn't fit into this chunk that is an hour and a half. So whatever question you can imagine, I guarantee you I asked it and have it recorded and it's either in the bonus materials or it's in a series of clips that I have like algorithms for to search by topic and word. And I will put out – yeah, I – 
I went crazy for this dude. High tech dude. So I can search for anything. That any is, topic. Well, and that's important too because now I know I have to review that material before we even get into and so should others before, you know, we begin the post, you know, right. Corbell is our yeah, movie yeah. discussion. Yeah. The evisceration of the detail, which we have to do. We have to get yeah. into it and ask the hard questions. And this is the whole reason I made the movie was to, you know, invigorate and alter the landscape of the debate. So I have achieved that. All you have to do is watch the film and then we'll go from there. But I'm just telling you, the bonus materials are important. So if you get mm -hmm. in on iTunes or Vimeo, and, and I'm saying it now so no one can misquote me. Those are the only two that you get all that you get bonus materials with iTunes and Vimeo. So you know, pre-order it or just order it, and you'll get that. You have to buy it, um, and you know, then you have a lot of extra information. But if it's not in there, Alejandro, and you have a specific question, I can type into my computer and pull up the visual clip, probably from multiple interview sessions. I have it's such a huge archive, and I can release that answer. So we have so much to work with now that is in, represented in the film, in the bonus material, and then on dozens and dozens of terabytes of my personal archive that I will share with the public when becomes appropriate. Yeah. So that's really exciting. Now, I guess my question, now getting back to kind of kind of you and your personal relationship here, how did that start? How did you first meet with uh, Bob? And, uh, you know, did you... Because, of course, many, 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 many have tried in the past. Uh, I didn't know if Bob would come onto the stage this you know, minutes before he showed up. And I was nervous as heck during the UFO Congress. And, and so and my input to have that little bit of interaction was, was George Knapp. But, um, you know, many have tried. How did you make that happen? Yeah, I mean, look, man, uh, I'm uh, lucky like a leprechaun. I, you know, I'm not sure <laughs> exactly how to answer that <laughs> other than the first time. Look, I think when you set an intention that you want to know the truth, when you're someone like me, um, I put into motion a lot of things based on that intention. I don't just sit there with a pipe dream. I learned that in jujitsu. If I wanted to learn how to, you know, tap out a bigger opponent, then inch by inch, I would learn where I'm messing up. And then you could start defeating bigger opponents, David and Goliath thing. So I put this thought in my mind. I want to know the truth about UFOs. Okay. I want to know the truth about Bob Lazar. Okay. So the first interaction was by chance. I was over filming at John Lear's house with John Lear, who's intimately connected to the reveal of Bob Lazar. And in comes Bob visiting John. Respectfully, I put the cameras down. I didn't film anything. We started talking and I said, hey man, I am a filmmaker. Any chance I can get a clip? I thought I had no chance. And if you remember back in the, right before the 25th anniversary, I got new footage of Bob Lazar and I shared it with the world for free. And it was so cool to be able to give the world just three minutes of extra Bob Lazar. So that was kind of like the first time. And by the way, I asked him all about 115 on that day. I've never released that footage. Oh, he shut me down so quick. I mean, he didn't know me from Adam. He shut me down so quick. He's like, that's the one thing that is so sensitive. We ain't talking about. Wow. And, um, yeah, and then, you know, you fast forward to five years later, there I am living at his house for weeks at a time, and yeah, I mean, I guess in some way I was, you know, surprised that he allowed this, um, sorry, I got, a, I got a fax coming in, must be important, whoa, sorry if you can hear that. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, that was, uh, you know, that was interesting. So how did it happen? Well, clearly through, uh, you know, maybe George Knapp saying, hey, Jeremy's actually, you know, not a knucklehead. He's a, a, a good reporter. And then, you know, having Bob, who's a fan of cinema, if, you know, Bob being a fan of cinema, um, he looked at my film work and said, wow, you know, um, stylistically, I, you know, Really, I don't know if I would trust anybody else to to do a story on on my work, you know, my life. So cinematically, he's really into film. He liked it. So I think it was a combination of George Knapp saying that I'm I'm not a knucklehead, and me being persistent and setting intention, and then luck that I met him one time. We had a good experience. Let me put him on camera, and then kind of just getting to know Bob over time, and him being able to trust me through his friend uh, Gene Huff, who I'm friends with as well. It all just came together where Bob finally said, okay, 
But to be honest with you, I didn't really get a verbal okay with him the first time. So I flew to Michigan and I wasn't sure if I was there to just hang out or film or what. I didn't want to assume, but I brought all my camera gear. And I'm like, so Bob, am I am I here because we're finally doing this? And he goes, well, yeah, that's, that's why you came out, right? Sweet. <laughs> it was funny, man. So long answer to your short question. No, that's just... great. That was all, it's really interesting to know. And thank goodness that, because you were the right person. I mean, I, I really think that this came out really well. And that we're out of time. So people still have a chance to go to the world premiere that's going to be in LA right on December 3rd. Yeah, I just want to make a statement that I think is really important. So okay. this is the world premiere, December 3rd. There are still tickets left. If you hear this before December 3rd, this is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. There will be a Q&A, and I'm doing it technologically. If you hashtag Bob Lazar into Twitter or Instagram, I will be reading as they come in, asking questions one at a time. The world can participate at about 9.30 p.m. on December 3rd. But come, get a ticket, be there, be part of this historic moment. My last statement is that, and this is so important, for the last three decades, Bob Lazar's critics have been holding the mic. It is time to take the mic back, and that's exactly what we're doing at the world premiere on December 3rd. You are going to learn who Bob Lazar is. So tweet hashtag Bob Lazar, and I will try to get him to answer your questions. And you can find out more at extraordinarybeliefs.com, but we also have a story at openminds.tv where we've got all that information as well. Thank you so much, Alejandro. It's a real pleasure to go on your show. And really, I do believe that this film has altered the landscape of the debate. So now let's watch it. And let's talk about it. I agree. And we'll be talking more. Thank you so much. Thanks, Alejandro. Thank you so much to Jeremy for being on the show again. Um, you know what I really appreciate is, is his loyalty. Of course, I've shared with you all how much I enjoy his films. And I think you all feel, you know, when you listen to the show, that I'm honest. And I would share with you if I had concerns. And I would share with him. I mean, him and I have debated pretty hardcore at times where we're even, you know, kind of like, Arr! but um I, I just think he's a great filmmaker. I think he did a great job with Skinwalker. Uh, and I think he even did a better job with this. And I got to say, you know, even the people I, I saw the show with felt similarly. They were like, wow, this is the best thing I've ever seen him do. But more than that, the information is really important. And, and I really genuinely feel, you know, to be honest, when I thought about asking him questions that we really can't talk about this until the film is out. And everybody hears Lazar's words himself. And uh, I, I hope that you all have a chance to see this film. And then, you know, we'll bring Jeremy on again in a couple of weeks. And uh, we'll talk and, and we'll debate some of the details. But I do want to let you know that uh, I also am thankful for Jeremy sharing so much cool stuff. So at openmindsteep.tv, he's allowed us to show a exclusive clip of this uh, film, you know, months ago. You all may remember that, but uh, he let us release the trailer in the beginning. You know, he got me that uh, comment from Mickey Rourke that I was able to post on Den of Geek. And if you want to see all of that, just go to openminds.tv. You'll see uh, this story and the stuff that Jeremy shared with me uh, and links to be able to get to this premiere that's coming up in a couple days and also see the trailer for this film and then uh, links to get the film to pre-order the film so you can be make sure and have a copy uh, once you it, it launches and then also links to what he was talking about I didn't even know about this that there's going to be kind of this live Q&A going on so that's going to be a lot of fun uh, during the premiere so open minds at TV and you'll see all of that and of course I want to thank Martin Willis he's such a cool guy from podcast UFO for joining me with the news at the beginning of the show also, check out ufocongress.com. We've got a lot of gifts. So Karen has bought a lot of really cool UFO and alien stuff that you could see at store.ufocongress.com. You can also find this just by going to ufocongress.com and clicking on the store. But uh, if you follow my social media, you'll see some of the videos that we've made showing, highlighting some of these cool things. And people are loving them. I mean, luckily, we can go to these conferences like AlienCon and see what people like, what kind of merchandise they like to, to purchase and, and buy. And, and it's a lot of fun. I mean, there is a fun aspect to all of this that I don't think we need 
need to deny. Uh, just because we enjoy, you know, the culture or, or being interested in this topic, I don't think it necessarily hurts the credibility personally of all of this. And I think I'm in a pretty good position to say that because I think uh, that we've got a good balance at openminds.tv of bringing credible information. That's why we get great attention by uh, mainstream media and uh, have great relationships with like these mainstream journalists like George Knapp. And at the same time, being able to enjoy, you know, being part of all this this cultural um, kind of resurgence of this topic that is not just cultural in that uh, we're enjoying uh, discussing and observing and, and pondering the topic, but we're also in a stage where we're getting more and more credible information. And I think understanding, we are gaining ground in these last few months, in this last year, well, faster and stronger than we have since at least since I've been in this. And I think many people such as George Knapp or Jeremy or others would agree with that. So it thank you all so much for coming along for the ride. And uh, I guess that's it. Thank you. A couple more thank yous, of course, to Caleb Hanks for the opening and closed music, Systematics for the bumper music. And once again, thank you all for listening. We'll have another great show coming up next week. Until then, adios muchachos.